And to the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Strengthen those things that remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember how thou hast received, and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I shall come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, that have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the shame shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith in the churches. Hey everybody, just wanted to uh, show you this beautiful countryside. We're um, driving from Thyatira to Smyrna. And, uh, Sardis, bro. Oh, Sardis, that's right. We already did Smyrna, that was the first one we went to. Um, it's easy to get the two mixed up. Anyways, it's just beautiful countryside here in Turkey. Wanted to show you guys. Um, it's just cool um, seeing the countryside and these small little towns and villages that you usually don't see in Turkey. So yeah, we're on our way. We're almost to uh, Sardis. Hey guys, praise the Lord. We're on our way to the next church. We're excited. We've been talking a lot about the uh, one-on-ones we've been having with people and just the interaction. We were just cracking up about the interaction with the cops. We, were just, we just found it so funny that it's like the people seem more concerned than the cops actually do, which is like, you don't always see that in, you know, at least in the States, it's kind of a mix too, but it was just funny, I don't know. We're just on the road here and it's a great time, man. Just the fellowship even and just reflecting and just talking and just bonding you know it's amazing and praise God it just you know we're excited we think God's really moving and and we see the bigger picture you know we see God setting more people out here and and more people getting engaged and involved so it's it's a blessing man we got brother Dakota driving right now we got brother Matthew memorizing the word right now praise God he's got to get ready for the next teaching so we're gonna be doing the church of Sardis Revelation 3 starting in Revelation 3 praise God we uh, just got preaching. Got done. meters, turn right onto Sardiolu. How you feeling after that last preach? We just got man? done preaching in Thyatira. How did you and feel, brother? After it was amazing. After you stepped out of faith. Lots of people God. were just, just a lot of people stirred up, so stirred up that the cops came. Um, they basically said you can't hand out the literature. Whatever, it's right. fine. So, turn right onto Sardiolu. We were able to keep preaching, we were able to preach, and so we were just gonna to go to these different cities with our little horn on Turkish, our little Turkish translation, turn the horn up, mm. and just, uh, I mean, I'll show you what we're doing, basically. Yeah, yeah, show them. So uh, we just, we got all our messages basically pre-saved in here. So what Matthew's been doing, uh, guys, is he's been up here making messages, gospel messages. So, Every person deserves to go to hell for the sins they have committed against God. You must turn to Jesus Christ and ask for him to forgive you of your sins and save you from the fires of hell. So then we translate that into Turkish. We play that through the speaker real loud. Not too loud. So, so now brother Tony, um, why don't you uh, make it so people can see a little bit of the Yeah, guys, so this is this is the countryside, man. This is us just traveling. And we're, we, we've, we've mentioned it a couple of times. We feel like Paul. We feel like we're... Look at guys. This, this is... Yeah, look at that mountain. That's just this so is beautiful. Turkey, guys. This is amazing. It's beautiful. God's creation. Turkey All the music. All of this was created by the Word of God in six days. The mountains and the trees and everything that was created. I guess there's another temple of Artemis here. It's so just check out, check out this, this scenery. This is what we've been looking at. that's the location over there. Could be. So this is it, 
right guys, praise God. Take the next left on Tequila Never in I'll show you guys some of the some of the locals if we drive by them. You see a lot of motorcycles here. That's what I'm noticing. A lot of motorcycles, a lot of different forms of transportation. You see these <laughs> tractors. Those are some of the locals right there. I've noticed uh, a lot of a lot of people really just stick to their own. You know, they just mind their own business. They don't really bother. A lot of these uh, folks just stick to their own business. They don't really mess with anybody. 400 meters, turn left. They sort of run their shops. You got a lot of these local shops that sell candy and chips and sodas and stuff. You see a lot of those. That's it guys, that's where we're headed. That's it guys, we're about to go in. So, there's a lot of heresies in modern Christianity, everybody already knows that. But not one of them is more significant or more prevalent than the teaching of once saved, always saved. Um, this verse out of the book of Revelation chapter 3 uh, basically puts that heresy to bed, okay? He says that those that walk with me in white will be worthy, and I will not blot out their name out of the book of life. Now listen, you got to have your name in the book of life for God to blot it out. So don't try to tell me they were never saved. He says, I will not blot out their name out of the book of life. He's making a promise to those that will walk with him in white because they are worthy. He's saying, you're going to walk with me in white because you're worthy and I'm not going to blot out your name. So, obviously, if you don't, if your garments are defiled and you're not walking with him in white and you're not worthy, then he is going to blot your name out of the book of life. I mean, it's pretty much common sense. All you have to do is read the Bible. So this was a promise made to the church of Sardis that God wasn't going to blot their name out of the book of life if they had undefiled garments. What do the, what do the, what do the garments represent? The garments represent um, you know, our state or our, our, how we stand with God. Yeah, our purity, our, our, purity. Our, our works, our, our works, spiritual condition, whether spiritual it's, condition, it's righteousness or unrighteousness, exactly. whether it's clean, cleanliness and, and holiness and purity or filthiness and sin. That's right. So um, God promises he's going to give them white raiment uh, because they've kept their themselves from being defiled. They're going to walk with him in white raiment. So. Yeah, this teaching on once saved, always saved, you just need to get to the book of Revelation and it's totally put to bed. It's totally the most ridiculous heresy, okay? Because then later you see people taking the mark of the beast. Uh, obviously you do that, you're not saved. I don't care what John MacArthur says. You take the mark of the beast, you're, you're doomed. Okay, you're not, gonna, you're not making it. And so, uh, you know, this is a really important teaching about righteousness. This church... Basically, he was analyzing what was their status and stance with God. First of all, he said, you have a name that you live and you're really dead. Okay. He didn't flatter them and say, oh, well, you guys are really doing great. You're a great church. I mean, you're doing a lot of works for me. And No, he said, you have a name and people think you're doing good things for God. But in reality, you're spiritually dead. And he just came out and said it. And so... Jesus didn't flatter anyone in the church of Revelation. None of the letters he sent were flattering to people. They weren't there to, to puff people up. They were there for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and instruction in righteousness. Yeah, even the, the two churches that didn't get a rebuke, uh, but they got a, a, they got a commenda uh, commendation. Yeah. Um, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Were the only two righteous churches. Yep. But even even those churches, even though they didn't get a rebuke, but a, a, uh, they got a commendation, but yet they still had a little bit of an exhortation of, you know, God telling them of something they, they still needed to do. Yes. So he was still telling them uh, to, even the Church of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. 
he was still saying that you needed to um, you know be prepared because I'm setting before you the open door yeah so we're still things that they were still going to have to do in the future I'm setting before you the open door mm -hmm. you can walk through it I'm opening it for you and Smyrna he said you're doing great but you're still gonna have to suffer tribulation and exactly persecution so days. so keep being faithful keep holding on right and so Sardis it's one of the shorter letters that, that Jesus gave in word wise uh, but it has deep profound uh, meaning when it comes to righteousness, uh, purity, which is obviously think something that's completely missing in modern Christianity. Uh, righteousness and purity just completely go out the window in most churches. Uh, the way that people are, and let's talk about clothes because that's what he was talking about here. He was talking about clothes. Mm -hmm. Folks, there's no reason for you to go to church and dress like a harlot. Yeah. If you're doing that, you are not living for God. Um, you know, we need to walk in worthy garments. Don't walk into a place of God and worship uh, like you're walking into some nightclub. Yeah, wearing Daisy Duke I short mean, it's ridiculous. shorts or yoga pants. He said, well, no, we got to be like them to win them. We got to be like them to win them. Let them come in looking like they're, you know, out of a rap video. No, that stuff needs to stay out of the church. Mm-hmm. The church needs to get purified, man. We need to get those kind of people out. Is it, oh, just bring them in. It's a hospital for sinners. Bring them all in and let them do whatever they want. No, get those people out and let's get this place purified. Well, let's, so let's now talk about um, another thing with, with uh, Sardis. And that is, um, we already mentioned this, but let's go into it a little more in depth. Yes. How it talks about the white garments. Yes. Those that have not defiled their garments, they will walk before me in white, for they are worthy. Yes. Now let's think about this. When you when you read the rest of the book of Revelation, there's a few other verses that touch on the same topic. In Revelation chapter 14, yes. it talks about these are those who came out of great tribulation, and they have um, they have washed their their garments in the blood of the Lamb, and they yes, have they have these these white robes of righteousness. That's right. And it says that the white robes are the righteousness of the saints. That's right. It doesn't say it's the righteousness of Christ, because the thing is, is that you can't, you, Christ's own righteousness can't be washed and made righteous in his own blood. That's it right. says that they washed their robes in the blood of Christ, meaning that they did the work of sanctification. It was the righteousness of Christ that purified the garment. Exactly, But the yes. garment itself was not Christ's garment. It was their garment. Exactly. That's the point that we're making. Yep. And so a lot of people say, well, you know, Christ makes up for all my sins. Christ makes up for all of my evil. I just live in evil and just Christ makes up for it all. No, Christ purifies you so that you can walk in white before God. That's the reason why he purifies you. He doesn't purify you so that you can go back into the filth, into the pig slop. Mm -hmm. That's not why he purified you. Yep. And Revelation also talks about the importance of being pure and holy when we go to stand before the Lord. Yes. Because it says in Revelation 22, 11, it says that when you die and stand before the Lord, whatever spiritual condition you're in let him that's that is holy that's be the, holy still let yep. him that is righteous be righteous still that let him that is filthy be filthy, filthy be still filthy still yep that's right him that so, is unrighteous be, be unrighteous, unrighteous still. still so after you die there is nothing you can do to change your righteous standing with god that's no you the condition you die in is the, is the condition, condition that you, you will remain in you stand before the lord and you will be judged in and then that's the condition that you will continue in for the rest of eternity whether it be dying in righteousness and holiness before the Lord and being accepted by him and brought into his kingdom or dying in a state of sin and then being rejected by the Lord yes. and and spending eternity in hell as a sinner. You know what you got to do uh, brothers and sisters you have to stop using your preconceived ideas and doctrines to try to interpret scripture. That is a big fallacy and there's a huge mistake. You don't do that. You don't take your doctrines 
your preconceived ideas, your little statements that you learned at the Baptist church, and compare it to scripture and say, well, well, does the scripture fit my doctrine? Does the scripture fit my doctrine? No, 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 you got it backwards. You take the scripture and you analyze that, and you say, does the scripture confirm my doctrine? Does the, does the scripture itself actually stand and witness with it? Okay, you look at the Bible objectively. You do not look at it through the lens of a doctrine or a lens of a belief or a, 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 the lens of a Bible teacher. You need to look at the scripture and say, look, names are getting blotted out. Okay, that's, that puts once saved, always saved completely away. It's not true. Mm -hmm. It's not in the Bible, anywhere in the Bible. Okay, it's, it's dead. Okay, because it's a false doctrine, a false belief. You know, in Thyatira, uh, God told uh, Jezebel to repent. Uh, the followers that followed her were going to be, she was going to kill with death. Okay, so, you know, just read the book of Revelation 2 and 3 and you will see that these are false teachings, false doctrines that are leading people to hell. Okay, you all, you, be, be not deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. They're not going in. So if you're going to walk in defiled, filthy, unrighteous garments of sin and, and uncleanness and fornication and homosexuality and theft and evil, guess where you're going to be spending eternity? It's just like the old hymns. Yes. 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 It's just like the, the old hymn, um, There's Power in the Blood. It says, are your garments spotless? Are they, they white as snow? Are, are they washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's right out of the book yep. of Revelation. Yeah, it's right out of Scripture. See, I used to think, wow, eternal security is this great thing. I mean, wonderful. I just say this prayer and then, you know, I can live the life that I want to live now. But then when I started reading the Scripture, I realized that once I come to Christ, I'm actually dead with Christ. I'm, I'm dead with him. I've been buried with him in baptism. So I'm, I'm, I'm not alive to myself. I can't do whatever I want to do anymore. I'm really dead to this world and alive to God. I'm crucified with Christ. Mm -hmm. So I'm not free to do the sins that I was doing before. I'm not free to do that. The Bible says we're slaves to righteousness. Yes, Amen. we're slaves to righteousness yep. yes. and to holiness. And like Tony was just saying earlier, that you were trying to say that um, in, in Ephesians 5, right? without yeah. spot or blemish above reproach yeah and that's the thing i wanted to talk about too is like christians just co cover themselves in this grace where it's it just excuses them to just live however they want i mean that's i mean i want to talk about dressing in churches that was a great message i mean at least for the women it's it's uh you know the way you dress is a testimony mm -hmm. you know when you go out in public when you go to the malls to school to your jobs it's um, you know, the way you dress is a testimony, you know, people see that and especially in the house of God, you see in the old Testament, uh, the Levitical priests had to dress a certain way. They had to, uh, there was so many regulations and rules in place for them to even step foot in the house of God. And, um, and if they weren't, if they didn't fit those regulations and those rules, they couldn't do it, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I don't know this idea of where just anyone could just walk into church and, and and not change and not re at least you know the thing is the pastors aren't even telling these women to rep they don't even confront them about it they'll let them come into the church week in and week out i, I get it maybe if it's one service they don't know but they're coming week in and dressing in yoga and short shorts man and, club pants and it's and, yeah it's yeah. a shame and all this is terrible stuff and, and and like you were um you reminded me of earlier that in you know ephesians chapter five it says Christ is only returning for the bride, his bride that is, um, you know, spotless and without wrinkle. The, right. the people that are truly wa uh, walking in holiness, that their garments are undefiled by sin. Right. You know, it's the righteousness of God which is revealed. So it's the righteousness. It's this idea yeah. of living holy and um, Christians are missing it. It's a shame that... Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and then they're you know, they're using the one saved always safe thing to cover it on. It's yep. yeah, what yep. and it, and it's it's. Look what he says here in Revelation chapter sixteen fifteen. I had to look it up because I didn't have it memorized. But he said this. He said, "Behold, I come as a thief." Just like he said to the church of Sardis there in, in chapter three. He said, "Behold, I come unto you as a thief. Blessed is he that walketh, watcheth, sorry, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked." 
and they see his shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I believe this, brothers and sisters. I believe that everybody that stands before God on the day of judgment at the great white throne judgment is going to stand 100% without any clothes on at all. They're going to be completely naked before God. Mm -hmm. They're not going to have anything on at all. Because they refused to wear the wedding garment. They're not going to have anything to wear. Mm -hmm. If you read in Matthew 22, Jesus gave one of his most incredible parables. It was a parable about a man who was invited to the wedding feast. And he came into the wedding feast, just like a lot of people come into church. But he would not put on the wedding garment. Now, the wedding garment was not something that he had to come purchase for himself. It wasn't something he had to, to provide for himself. The wedding garment was always given by the host. It was provided by the host. He was invited. He came in, but he would not put on the wedding garment. What does this parable mean? Because the man snuck in, wouldn't wear the wedding garment, the king came in to see the guests, and he found the man not having on the garment. He said, why did you come in here without a wedding garment? He said, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus was saying, if you're not going to wear the garment, you're going to face the consequences and the consequences are hell. Mm -hmm. That's why righteousness is so important. That's why having the righteousness of Christ being clothed in white raiment is so important. Because without it, you will never enter heaven. Yeah, that parable represents the Christian who thinks that they're going to heaven just based upon their faith, but yet doesn't actually have, have the, fruit. Oh, the fruit and the obedience and the sanctification. And on Judgment Day, they're going to get pride. they're going to get thrown out into outer darkness, and they're going to be really surprised, just like the guy in that parable who he thought he was going to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then he gets kicked out unexpectedly. So we're here at Sardis, as we can see here. Um, you know, this is uh, you know 2,000 years old. We're looking at a 2,000 year old city um, here in Turkey, um, a place where the gospel was preached 2,000 years ago. Jesus had a specific message for this actual church right here that you are looking at. We are standing in the place where Jesus sent a message to this place um, and told them basically you need to walk in white in order to be worthy. You need to walk in white raiment. You, need, you don't need your clothes to be defiled by the things of this world. But then he gives them a promise, doesn't he, brother? Mm -hmm. What is that promise? He said, he that overcomes same should be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name. But then he says, I will confess his name, my Father, for his angels. Amen. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. What did that guy say today about Pergamum? I don't want to talk about this. So, we're up in Pergamum today, on the top of where Satan's seat was, and we ran into a Taiwanese man. And uh, we were talking, and he, he said, well, well, I told him we're Christians. You know, we're out here to tell people about Jesus. He said, oh, I'm a Christian too. And then I told him, you know, we're out here telling people the gospel of Jesus Christ in these cities and places. And he's like, oh, well, well they're Muslim. <laughs> See the problem with the church today? They think, oh, they're Muslims. They don't need the gospel. They've got their own religion. No. <laughs> They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the problem with the church is basically the attitude that that guy had right there. Mm -hmm. They said, these people are not reachable with the gospel. Uh, why would you preach the gospel to them? They're Muslims, just whatever. They're, you know, like that's the attitude. Just leave them alone because they're just Muslims. Mm -hmm. No, all the more reason to go to them to preach the gospel to them. 
all the more reason to preach the gospel because they need Jesus Christ. Everybody needs Jesus Christ. I don't care where you're from, Bangladesh, Indonesia, mm -hmm. Java. I don't care if you're from the islands of the sea. I don't care if you're from Burma. I don't care if you're from Mongolia. I don't care if you're from Sweden. I don't care if you're from Finland. I don't care if you're from uh, Argentina, Chile, Peru. You need Jesus Christ in your life. And it's about time that the Christians wake up and realize that and stop making excuses for why they will not go. Yep. I'm getting tired of hearing people say, oh, well, why would you do that? They're Muslims. Or they say, oh, well, you can't, you know, you can't preach the gospel in Turkey or because oh, it's heard. too dangerous. Oh, oh you can't. You just like can't the guy last night who was a Turkish guy, he was like, I, I said, why are you out here with your little machine? Like, tell you know, what are you saying on your on your little machine? I said, well, I'm saying Bible verses and Bible passages about Jesus. He said, oh, you can't do that. And then it was like he told that to the cop and the cop was like, well, I don't care. <laughs> See, the people are literally more outraged by us be here preaching the gospel than the authorities are. The authorities don't even care. They really don't. I mean, yeah, there's a certain rules that you have to follow or the like, you know, you can't pass out literature, they said, but we've been doing it. But they're not outraged by it. They've let us just preach the gospel. It's the people that are ingrained in that religious culture that are so offended by the fact that we're here. Mm -hmm. We gotta break up that follow ground. Right, yep. right. You see Paul going back to Jerusalem after he knew he was gonna get stuck. Yes. He knew, and he was like, he, it, they're, they're, Christians need to stop being so scared to cross that boundary, that line where they don't want to impede on anyone's comfort. They don't want to impede on 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 like that barrier that people set up. And you stop being afraid to break you that. You know what? God just gave me a message. You know what He said to me? He just said this right now. This is organic. You'll never have any progress until you get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. There'll that's never true. be any progress until you stop worrying about being so comfortable. Yep. Amen. Never. Oh, I'm too uncomfortable to go preach. I'm too uncomfortable to go stand in front of a marketplace. I guarantee you, every single person that's watching this video, you have a, a public location, probably within 50 miles of your house, some a lot closer, that you could go to where there is consistent foot traffic where you could proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But to see, you won't do it because you, are, you feel uncomfortable. It, that's all it is. You live in the freest country in the world if you're from the United States. The only reason you don't do it is because you feel uncomfortable. Well, don't expect to effect any change in this world unless you stop worrying about being so comfortable. Yeah, and if you're if you're too scared, if you don't have the boldness, you're nervous to share the gospel, then pray for God to give you the boldness, and He will. I don't and understand. You'll be able to do it. If people are really rot, going to rot in an eternal hell and have their names blotted out of the book, and you're worried about feeling uncomfortable, that is the, the laziest, sorriest, silliest excuse I've ever heard of. Mm -hmm. You must really not believe in hell. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But listen, wait a minute, why don't we go to John? And John says, he that, is right, he that doeth righteous is righteous even as he is righteous. He didn't come to break a few filthy, stinking habits in my life and change my cursing lips to blessing lips. He came to do more than that. I believe again, the greatest miracle in the world is that God can take an unholy man out of an unholy world, make that unholy man holy, put him back in an unholy world and keep him holy. That takes all the blood of the cross and all the power of the Holy Ghost. And your will in total submission to God. A world famous preacher was in my office not long ago. I said, tell me this. You cross the world. You've been through many cities in America. Can you give me the names of ten holy men that you know? No, I can't. Well, think about the holy preachers. I can't. You know, holiness is not a luxury, it's a necessity. One of the most astounding verses I never preached on it is where God says we can be, in Hebrews, what, 12 or 13, we can be partakers of his holiness. And then two verses after, the most shattering verse, it says, without holiness no man shall see the Lord. How many people do we die a bury or backslidden? And we say some nice holy words over them. Some people put what they call holy water. They die backslidden. 
without holiness, no, is the sanctification in the sepulchre? Does some miracle take place between there and the resurrection? No, sorry, you're right. As a tree falls, so it lies. 